Hello everyone, I'm Jesse. And I'm John. With Baptist, Baptist for Africa. God spoke by Isaiah and said, I am the Lord thy God, which teacheth thee the prophet, and leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. And I really feel like God's been guiding us and directing us over these many years that we've now been here in Uganda, uh, especially in the matter of pioneering work that we've been doing and engaged in. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we had no example when we came here. Even the men who should have, because they had been here for many decades, known everything about Uganda and everything about how the ministry is supposed to work, were listless and really had no advice and no ability to be able to counsel us at all. We had to get all of our advice from God, like the Bible says, thy testimonies are my counselors. So we had to learn as we went, as the Bible tells us that of the man who goes out sowing of the seed, it says his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him. As opposed to having some person that can mentor us and teach us, which thing we didn't have at all here in Africa, we rather had God to be our teacher or leader, like Samuel. Didn't have any person to lead him or guide him, we just had the Lord, which was the one that instructed him in the way that he should go, in the work that he should do. Yeah, and even Paul said when he um, was going up to Jerusalem after many years to see the apostles who seemed to be somewhat in conference, he said they added nothing to me. So even sometimes there are uh, things that we did learn from perhaps a couple people here or there, but no one systematically sat down and tried to explain to us how to be an effective missionary or here's how you actually evangelize all of Africa. And I think the reason why is because most people are little-minded Christians. They're like lot Christians. They want to go to Zoar. You know, they want the, is it not a little one? They want the little city. They're not really interested in the big works for God. They don't have this vision of, uh, as Jesus said, teach all nations. He didn't just say, you know, teach your zip code or, or teach this small little village. But he says, preach the gospel to every creature. You know, with all the different innovations and different ideas that God is giving us, as we are continuing to serve him faithfully here in Africa, I oftentimes have said to myself, I wish that I could go and talk to myself of five years ago, before we even came to Africa, and say, this is exactly what you're going to do. Because we would have been so much more effective for the entire time. But I think that the humbling experience of going through, as it were, the wilderness of, of this learning experience caused us to start to depend more on God and look more to Him. And that when we do, of course, find these new means whereby we can serve God in a greater way, it ultimately isn't just simply uh, forgotten or uncared for or done without diligence, but we do it with all of our zeal. Yeah, and I think part of the truth that is expressed by this idea, you would probably agree, is that if we continue with this ministry for a few more years by the grace of God, then we will look back even still yet and say, I wish that I could go back 10 years ago and talk to myself before I came to Africa or even five years ago. So I think God just continuously teaches us and it shows the dynamics of a ministry that's alive, uh, not a dead thing, but something that's constantly changing and learning and growing and becoming better. Of course, all of this comes at a great personal price. Our church has suffered a lot. God says of a Paul that I will show him what great things he will, must suffer for my namesake. So uh, in order for you to do a great work for God, you have to suffer a tremendous amount. The Bible says we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And uh, to me, for example, I've had a lot of problems with diseases, uh, especially malaria, and other kinds of uh, illnesses and afflictions. And of course, our churches had a lot of afflictions too, themselves. Having to go from one place to another, moving from here to there, having no certain place to dwell in. Afflictions are no big novel uh, idea to someone who has been serving God, because the Bible tells us the Apostle Paul through infirmity preached the gospel to the Galatians of the first, and he did everything he did with authority in his flesh. So it is in the midst of affliction that God really uses us in a great way. Yeah, and also there's other things that happen in this ministry too, that uh, of course when we first get to Uganda, it's extremely receptive to the gospel, but as time goes on, people, the Bible says, evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, people get less and less receptive, but we, we just continue to preach the gospel even more to compensate for that unreceptivity. And also, it seems that although we spend a lot of time on souls and minister to people, yet the Bible says that uh, uh, there are many people planted on the ground which uh, has thorns and it begins to choke the word and becomes unfruitful. So oftentimes you have to deal with spiritual grief in a ministry too. 
where people you minister to and love and care for begin to become worldly and they fall away from the things of God. But nevertheless, these are all light afflictions, you know, that work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And they're eclipsed by the success that God blesses this ministry with. Yes. Yeah, and speaking of success, John, why don't we tell people what happened in the last couple months? The yeah, results. Like, the Bible says in the book of Song of Solomon, let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see whether the vine flourish, whether the tender grip appear, and the pomegranate is put forth. Yeah. The Bible says that uh, when Paul came back and preached to people and told them of the great things that God was doing, he declared particularly what things God had wrought by his ministry. So I think it's a really important thing to ask a missionary uh, what is actually happening as a result of the work you're doing. Lots of missionaries like to tell a story about somebody getting saved or giving a gospel tract to someone. But let's actually ask the question of this ministry, for example, over the last couple months, what has God wrought? It's actually pretty surprising to think about the idea that over just two months' time, about 60 days of time, 1,771 people were led to Christ out soul winning. And then of that number, uh, which is a huge number, 73 of those people came to church. And of course, they didn't just come to church on their own. That almost never happens. Yeah, no one here really comes to church on their own. And you know, many churches, they get visitors because people see the sign or something online or whatever. Here, most if not every single soul who comes to church comes because of very diligent follow-up of us going back to their house or calling them or like the Bible says of this man who lost his lamb, he goes and seeks till he finds it and then puts it on his shoulders and brings it back with him. And there were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was lost from the hills away, far off from the gates of the fold. So even though they are a believer, they put their faith in Jesus, they need someone to guide them. They need someone to lead them to the truth, to fountains of living water, where they can uh, be refreshed by loving Jesus. That's one of the really cornerstones of our ministry. That we don't just want to preach the gospel like Paul said to the Thessalonians, that he to declare not to declare to the gospel of God only, but also his own soul, because they were dear unto us. And also beyond the people who got saved and people who came to church, we had three more people become soul winners over these past two months. One of them was a woman named Jackie, was someone actually who got saved about two years ago, I think. Yeah, she actually has a, a home in Demowongo, near where the church used to be down there, and uh, she was one of the first persons I preached to in Nebowango, and she has a really interesting story of how she had spent a lot of time in the Catholic Church and finally got saved. She actually was telling me one time about a story about being in the Catholic monastery, if I can remember the story correctly, and she says that the, the fathers, or these, these, these basically men wearing dresses, walking around with their collar turned around backward, <laughs> the Catholic priest, she, she, she was saying that uh, across from where she was sleeping, there was this room that had this red light that you could have the door crack, cracked open and she, she would always look in there and then they would always say, she would always ask them, what's inside of that room? And they would say, don't go in that room. What do you think they were doing in worshiping Satan? Anyway, she has, Jackie has a lot of interesting stories about uh, her time in the Catholic Church and so she's redeeming the time because the days are evil and winning not only Catholics but every person who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus to take back the time that she had lost. There's actually another woman also who became a soul winner these past couple months named Angela Nevokinia. She's the namesake of your own wife, but uh, she is the sister of a man named Pius who I led to the Lord uh, shortly after we got to this country, just a couple months after. And uh, finally his sister got saved a couple years later and then she just became a soul winner herself. And not only her, but also another man named Boreen who I had led to Christ three years ago, who uh, of course he fell away slightly here or there, certain cares of this world, but then he came back to church a few months ago and has been very zealous in God's house and he actually himself became a soul winner too. So you see, even though people are faithful to our church for a very long time, they have to bring forth fruit with patience and not everyone immediately is able to lead others to Christ. Some people, it takes them a, a much longer time, but slowly but surely, if you follow Jesus, he will make you a fisher of men. Yeah, and this is why the Bible says we have to exhort one another daily while it is called a day. Because you never know the person who kind of is slipping away from the church and is, doesn't seem kind of interested in the things of God, or you think this person will never be a soul winner. You never know. Give it a year, give it two years. If God is working on that person, they can eventually become a fisher. And most people who are great soul winners now, I am going out preaching the gospel with them, which is sometimes think to myself, is this person ever going to be able to lead people to the Lord? And you know what? God faithfully causes them to be able to 
uh, deliver people from this present evil world through the preaching of the gospel. Well, we uh, decided that although, of course, we could continue preaching at about an hour's length, it's more efficient if we just preach for around 45 minutes because of the fact that people are getting basically the same content anyway, and more people are able to listen for longer when you're not preaching for too long. Yeah, well, we've learned actually that with Africa, less is more. So although it's important to preach for a long time, especially if the Spirit of God is really present in that sermon and uh, you feel led by God to go a little bit longer, I mean, Paul did that, it says he was long in preaching one time, but it seems that most people today, especially in our really just foolish culture, uh, need a sermon which is something you know, which is able to be understood in a shorter amount of time. Even this video we're making right now, the, the editor, he's going to put in all these different B-roll and things like that because most people, they're just too stupid to be able to focus for more than 10 to 15 seconds. So... <laughs> I'm reading a book about, uh, it's called Amusing Ourselves to Death. The danger is not that, as George Orwell predicted, we would be people who lose our ability to get access to information because of Big Brother or some because of the fact that we have no more availability, but rather just the simple fact that we wouldn't want to have information anymore because we would desire only to be entertained. And that's what we're doing today. It's an entire book that basically destroys television and shows how people's attention span, people's mindsets, people's ways of even communicating have been destroyed by the television and by the uh, new age in which we live of basically the now now this culture, the, the sound by culture in which we live. And, uh, anyway. and that book is actually, you told me, pretty prophetic in a sense, because it's written like 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, the man wrote it in 1985, right after George Orwell's prediction of 1984 basically was proved wrong. He said, George Orwell was wrong. Uh, Aldous Huxley was right. <laughs> And then actually, the drug, the drug, Soma, in Aldous Huxley's book that everyone, everyone is intoxicated by actually turns out to be technology. Both of these are actually horrible, horribly filthy novels, 1984 Brave New World. Yeah, but uh, in some sense, uh, like it says of Caiaphas, that he, this he spake not of himself. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I can't but help but see that Paul also is a forebear to this man too in this sense because he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine yeah. he's saying that in the future at the end of his life as Paul's dying he's saying there's a coming a time when people they can't sit through a sermon even 45 minutes or an hour but they'll go you know and listen to stupidity and foolishness for hours on, on end They'll go and watch a movie of wickedness and evil. They'll go and listen in the market to uh, hawkers screaming and yelling. They'll go and just uh, listen to worldly music, rap, and just screaming and yelling at them. But uh, they can't endure God's word. They can't endure the Bible. So, but uh, we're not trying to conform to this idea, but we are trying to come down to the level where the preaching that we have, the sermons that we're making, just like Ezekiel, he had object lessons, or uh, Isaiah or other prophets, and just like other people, in the Bible, when they preached, they were basically Jesus throwing them out, although it probably was longer in its original. Yet, uh, if you read Matthew 5 to 7, it's only about 15 minutes. So. They served their generation and preached in a way that people could understand and in a way that people would receive it and take it as they were able to bear it. That's how Jesus, the Bible says, preached. The common people heard him gladly. So, the um, way that we preach now is, I think, much better. Another interesting development that's happening is that we're going to begin a new foundations class, which will replace our old discipleship class. Our old discipleship class was a series of 10 lessons that we would teach, taking people through the basic practices of Christianity. But we decided to reformat and rethink that class to make it easier for people to access, to make it uh, more engaging with the people uh, of eight lessons as opposed to 10. Similar content, but uh, teaching for lesser time in those classes and uh, maybe having some biblical games and uh, a little a few more songs than we sing. And also, in those classes, uh, the emphasis will be really on the doctrine, as opposed to now we realize that you must separate the doctrine from the practice when it comes to these basic practices. Like, we need to go ahead and have someone sit down with them and teach them how to read the Bible, as we often do ourselves anyway systematically help people to memorize or help people to sing loud in church or systematically teach them how to pray 
and uh, that's best done, I think, by a, a biblical mentor. What we were lacking inside of this church for so long is biblical mentorship. You see, the people who teach those discipleship lessons that we have been instructing all the new believers in and causing them to know the basics of Christianity, basically not only function as the teacher, but also as the mentor. And of course, because the church has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are coming to it, the inevitable result of having one person who has to mentor hundreds of people, another who has hundreds of people to mentor, is that most of those people go neglected. And the few people who are uh, prized or valued end up becoming faithful and regular and godly people. Whereas the majority who unfortunately slip through the cracks, which cracks are many when you have hundreds and hundreds of disciples and one, two, three, four disciples, is uh, just simply a very unfortunate gap of the ministry. So what we've done is we've decided that we're going to instruct and train the entire church who are mature in the faith, people who have come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, those people who are basically uh, mature believers and show them, hey, you should go one-on-one -on -one and mentor people and everyone should have at least one, if not more people that they are personally mentoring. Just like Barnabas mentored Paul, just like Paul mentored Timothy. So this is exactly God's plan that we'd be people who personally disciple one another. Well, God is doing a lot of exciting things here in Uganda, and uh, I do pray and hope in all of Africa very soon, but it's only gonna be possible by you. So we thank God for all of your prayers and for all of your support to this ministry. And uh, if you've ever been led by God to uh, assist in any way, uh, I ask uh, that you would uh, prayerfully consider it and uh, don't hesitate because any amount that you can donate or any prayer you can offer or anything that you can do, it always helps to further the work of God and uh, make us be more effective to be able to do the work of God to spread the gospel to all of Africa. And through the generosity that's been uh, exhibited by the people abroad, their liberal distribution unto this work that's going on, we have now reached the state at this church, the Bible Baptist Church, which is a mission of Baptist for Africa, uh, where it's almost entirely self-sufficient, where yeah. the church can support its own self. So that way, now when people give to the ministry of Baptist for Africa, we can begin doing bigger things and going beyond just simply a local church and going and maybe planting more churches or doing big crusades evangelistically or going and doing great enterprises for the kingdom of God because of the fact that this church, thanks God, that it has grown to such an extent that it is able to uh, now begin to foot its own bill. Yeah, and there's a lot of places domestically here in Uganda we would love to go to, places like uh, in Bali or places like Gulu City, and even internationally. It would be really cool to go to other places in East Africa, maybe in Kenya or even in South Sudan, who knows, uh, God willing, and then other places beyond, even in Southern Africa or, or Western Africa, and wherever God would lead what's, us. What's just really fascinating is that God eventually creates these uh, churches like this, Baptist Baptist Church, where it becomes large enough to where it now can basically support itself, and then we can go and continue doing even bigger things. Yeah, and then uh, by, by means of the assistance and the help of many people, ye also helping together, the Bible says, it allows us to evangelize not merely a certain jurisdiction of Africa, but really uh, to have our vision set on all of Africa, and that we get to see not merely uh, this particular tribe of Africans in heaven, but we get to see all kinds of tribes in Africa in heaven. What a great joy through this ministry. Yeah, we don't want to just simply stay in one place. We want to, as the Bible tells us, go everywhere preaching the word. Jesus said, teach all nations, right? Preach to every creature. And so our goal is ultimately to reach the entirety of Africa. And it is a privilege to be able to be workers together with God and be here in God's husbandry, God's building, so eventually we can see God's reward. God's also been burdening our church, it seems, because at the prayer meetings, we see certain people praying things like, oh God, I pray you'd help us to get to other places in Africa and be able to reach them with the gospel because this continent is so dark. It needs more laborers, it needs more preachers. Thank you so much for all your interest in this ministry and may God be with you.